But I'm being seeing again that the essence of God is not love. The essence of God is holiness. How many times in the scripture is God called love? God is love, John says. Maybe twice at the very most. But over and over and over again, we read of the, the holiness of God. And in Revelation, it doesn't say that those holy beings in heaven cease not by day and night to say, love, love, love. They cease not by day and night to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He calls his house holy. While well, I was reading there this morning, these, uh, some of these chapters, nearly, I nearly take off when I read them. In 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 29, it says, Give thanks unto God, give glory that is due to his name, bring an offering and come before him, and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. When he came into the upper room after his resurrection, what did they do? They fell at his feet and they, they humbled themselves and they worshipped. What do the four and twenty elders do in the book of the Revelation? Even the four and twenty elders in the indescribable, ineffable glory of eternity, they fall down and worship him. This is far removed from the frivolous stuff of the day in which we live. There's not much emphasis on holiness today. The emphasis is happiness. The emphasis is not character, it's charisma. It's not what God can do in you, it's what God can do for you. He's a great utility God. Short of cash, tell him. Need healing, tell him. Got a problem, let him solve it. Now he'll do all those things very often, but that's not the main thing about God. People run themselves weary. Even preachers have breakdowns and others. Do you know why? Because they don't know how to stop and worship. And after all, when you've been to a meeting, it's not how exciting it is, how many miracles there were. The thing is this, have you had a revelation of God's holiness? Have you seen God's majesty? Do you leave it with awe? And if you decide to live a holy life, brother, you better be prepared for loneliness. Because a lot of people want to be good, and a few more people want to be spiritual, but very few people want to be holy. Do you know why? Because you won't get opposition from the world from being holy and say you want to be holy. You'll get opposition from the theologians and the preachers. They say the heart can't be cleansed from sin. You need a little bit of sin to keep you humble. Oh, well, why not have a lot of sin and be real humble? If you need a little bit of sin to be humble, the humblest men must all be in jail this morning. Well, you can't live without sin. Well, Jesus said to a woman taken in adultery, go and sin less. Isn't that what the Amplified says? Or is it in the Living Bible? Well, what did he say? Go on sin. No what? To a woman who hadn't been, knew a thing about the blood of Christ, or the cross, or the death, or the rest. Go on sin no more. People say we sin because we have to. No, 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 we don't. We sin because we want to. We choose our sins. This man is lustful. He chooses a woman. That man is a thief. That man has a lot of malice, that man has something else. You see, immediately you talk about living a holy life, somebody will say, ho ho, sinless perfection. Well, I think I'd rather be accused of that than be accused of a, a Christian practicing sin anyhow. You say, well, if you get really sanctified, doesn't it mean it's impossible to sin? No, it means it's possible not to sin. I was at a conference in a certain university with one of the great broadcasters of this country speaking. And he talked about sin, you know, we sin every day, thought, word, and deed. And I said, look, there's a, there's a congregation of, I don't know, a couple of thousand people. Look, there's over a thousand young people under 20 years of age. And they're, they're puzzled in this generation of promiscuous living and, and all the liberality and so forth. And you say we have to sin. Would you do me a favor, he said, if I could? Well, I said, you can't, but try. Would you tell these young people what sins they can commit and what sins they can't commit? If you say they have to sin every day, give them a list of sins that are permissible. Now, I know many of you don't know much about the Bible. <clears throat> That's why you came here, but... How many times did Adam sin before he got kicked out of the garden? How many times? Oh, so he gets punished and we don't, eh? We, we, we just live on a cycle of victory, defeat, victory, defeat, cleansing, impurity, and so forth. In a very famous Bible school not long ago, theological seminary, 
somebody asked the professor, well, what about the sanctified life? Well, he says it's a perpetual approximation to an unrealizable uh, ideal. Isn't that gorgeous and soothing? See, we kind of figure you can go to heaven, well, first class, second class, or third class. You see, God is a God of love, and, and he's not too worried because actually he never sees you. He sees you through Jesus Christ. That's pure bunkum. If he only sees me through Jesus Christ, who's, and I commit sin continually, who's going to answer for the sin? Jesus Christ? Well, he imputes righteousness. He does more than that. He imparts righteousness. God is holy. Because he's holy, he hates sin. Because he's righteous, he must punish sin. Because he's merciful, he forgives sin. But he doesn't ask me to sin every day in thought and word and deed. Man needs more than forgiveness, he needs cleansing. And we say to people, come and we, you can be filled. Listen, I've been in hundreds, thousands of meetings where preachers said, you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, come forward. I've never been in a meeting yet where somebody said, you want to be emptied. Do you think the Holy Ghost is going to come in your heart with uncleanness, with secret lust, with pride, with envy, with an unforgiving spirit? But again, our emphasis is happiness, not holiness. It's charisma, not character. It's power, not purity.